win our weekly jackpot with Paddy's Pick 5. Pick 5 winners from our 5 races to win. Enter for free online. Paddy Power! Hello everyone, welcome to Road to Cheltenham. I'm delighted to say that Ruby Walsh is back in the house. Ruby, did you have a good holiday? Lovely holiday, Lydia, yeah, super. Myself and Gillian and the four girls, it's been a wonderful week, yeah. Fantastic, very nice. I'm glad to see you back, relaxed, back in the chair and ready to go. We are going to start with the big news which came yesterday from Davy Russell and it was this. His retirement has lasted barely a month. This is due to Jack Kennedy having unfortunately uh, fractured his tibia and fibula in a fall from top bandit at NACE on Sunday. Davy Russell has said that he is coming back whilst Jack is on the sidelines. It's only been a matter of weeks since he's been retired. He's ridden out more this morning than I have in many years. We're a close team in Cullentra and after what happened last weekend, I want to help through the team through a difficult few weeks. The plan is to resume at Ferry House on Saturday. Ruby, did this surprise you? No, uh, <laughs> it didn't. Um, I'm actually laughing at the statement. If he wrote out more yesterday morning than he has in the last couple of years, he didn't write much in the last couple of years, did he? Um, but no, it didn't surprise me. He's only retired uh, 27 days, or there'll be 27 days to his resumption even. No, it, it didn't surprise me at all. And this is so, it's difficult though, isn't it? Because everybody said their goodbyes, everybody's wound up to, to sort of the, the retrospective on his career. He's stepped away. Um, it's, it must be difficult for those closest to him. I have no doubt it is. Um, it is, but look at, I don't know, what does it tell you? What does it show you? I'm not sure. Um, I think the last line of his own statement when he retired probably left the door open because he said, I'm sad to be giving it up. That's probably the line of someone who's not ready to give it up and he's got another chance to have another go. So um, that's probably what he's doing. What do you make of the line? He's, he's stressed that they're a very close team at Gordon Elliott's. Uh, if you're Jordan Gainford, you just had a brilliant Christmas. If you're Sam Ewing, you're being identified as the new upwardly mobile star. How are they feeling? <laughs> they're both human. <laughs> I'd say they're good, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Um, and they're two competitive people. They have to be disappointed. There's no beating around the bush. If mm. they're not, they're not competitive and they are two competitive lads. I'd say they are bitterly disappointed that Davy Russell has found his riding boots and he's hoping to fit into them. Would you have done it if the same thing had happened in your circumstances? I don't think so um, because I retired on a Wednesday and Shaq and Bushwa won a great one on the Saturday on the Thursday. I was jocked up to ride him. Benny Dejou won on the Saturday and went to win the French champion. Or no, different circumstances. Whenever you retire, you're going to leave winners behind you and you're going to miss winners. And But look, I was in a I was pretty clear about what I was doing. I was mm. ready to give it up. Um, there was no coming back for me. But look, different people. I, mm. As Davey said in his own retirement statement, I'm sad to be given up. I wasn't sad to be given up. So there's two different mindsets. OK, well, exciting news. And we look forward to the weekend and the return, unexpectedly, of Davey Russell. We need, to, though, to look back on what's happened in the past seven days. And we're going to start with Ruby's Analyse This. So this week for Analyze This, you had four options on which to vote for. You had Tamouris, Harry Cobden, Love Envoy, Johnny Burke, both at Sandown, Tell Me Something Girl at Nace for Rachel Blackmore and Champ Kylie at Nace for Danny Mullins. And the results, even unsurprisingly, were heavily in favour of Danny Mullins on Champ Kylie. 62%, 17% for Tamouris, 10% for Love Envoy and 11 for Tell Me Something Girl. So we shall analyse... Champ Kylie in the Lawless Hotel, Novice Hurdle. And a front running ride, hardly surprising from Danny Mullins. He's done it so often on Flooring Porter. He booked out on Champ Kylie, who does go markedly to his right. That's not unusual for him. Has a good jump go to the right at the first hurdle. Danny was going a decent gallop. But watch as he takes off at the second and lands. Wait now. The last horse, Affidel Fury, is quite a distance behind. He was going a good distance early. Now, Ben past the stands. Look at Danny from his head to the back of his breeches. Look at the angle of his body. All his body weight's on his left leg as he's trying to steer Cham Kylie around the bend without just using his hands. He stuck all his body weight onto his left leg to get Cham Kylie around that bend. And you can see the horse's head is turned as he's leaning out to his right. He does prefer to go 
right than left there's no doubt about that away from that hurdle Danny flicks him again now he had gone a good gallop but as it turned to the 7 furlong gate you can see how Danny has stacked the field up from Cham Kylie to Affidale Fury at the back it's not that far but it's, he hadn't gone slow he'd gone a good gallop and the rest had to catch up with him more so than he'd slowed down third last hurdle a lot of horses off the bridle Irish point on the outside starting to get there at the very back Monbeg Park has gone Kalanisi Star in front of that Danny had gone a good gallop and he's maintained it he got tight to the wing of the second last, hur last hurdle as Paul had a look inside and he doesn't go for everything until he gets by the wing of the bypass last hurdle and he's enough to last home from there Nace does suit horse the race on the pace but Danny didn't st stall this and slow it down he went a good even gallop he was able to save a bit in the worst of the ground from the stands to the seven furlong gate and he had enough to last home he rode this horse with stamina and stamina won him the race it was very testing as well on this day and more of a test as well with the last two hurdles having been bypassed definitely when you take out jumps that means that people start to race from the third last hurdle they don't have to save a bit to jump to second last or last so bypassing makes races more stamina laden and plus with, with the ground as well, which yeah. was definitely pretty testing. Right, there's a couple of tweets that came along when you were voting. We'll start with Simon Cross. And Simon, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going to have to tell you off because it is clear from this tweet, don't you think, Ruby, that Simon has not listened very carefully to our analysis of the Royal Bond. His bad run last time out. We, we, like, we explained that in great detail. <laughs> <laughs> See us after class, Simon. Good luck, Simon. Do you want to reprise it for him? No, I mean, I just... <laughs> I'm going to be kinder. I mean, what kind of parallel universe is it when I am the kinder one of the pair? <laughs> <laughs> this is terrifying. <laughs> Honestly, you should be terrified. Uh, he just ran away with Paul Tannend in the Royal yeah. Bond and uh, it just, the race developed far too far out and he finished really tired. He did. The, the, the winner, Marine Nationale, was the one who took his time the longest. Um, it just, that's racing. There was a, a blatant, obvious excuse on the day for it. Tripwise we'll come back to and we'll also talk about Grange Clare West in a moment. And then there's this tweet from Ah Whatever. He voted for Champ Kylie and he wanted, at the risk of raising your ire, you to have a look back at the other ones back to fifth. And the implication that I'm getting from that tweet is that people out there think the race was steadily run, that Danny kicked and he nicked the race. And you've stressed that you, you, it very much was not that case. No, it didn't look it to me. It didn't look it was too many horses off the ride at the third last. But we can do that in a minute. Um, I'm not going to analyse in five rides in one race. <laughs> So now we've been going to talk more generally about the novice hurdlers because there's also the Grade 1 Tolworth run at Sandown on Saturday as well as the Grade 1 Lawless and Lace on Sunday. We'll start, I think, Ruby, by talking about Champ Kylie. It's clear that he's going to get entries in the Supreme and in the Ballymore. They're both on the tightly turning left-handed track at Cheltenham. He definitely goes out to his right. That wasn't a fluke, was it, at, at Nace? He did it at Tipperary. Yeah, he did, but William Mullins trains him, so he'll be in the Albert Bartlett as well. Have you no doubt about that? If he does go right. Here he is, early doors of Tipperary, um, when he won a grade three over two miles in a tight, fast track. But he does go to his right. There's no doubt about that. And look, he's most likely going to run in the, on on the old course at Cheltenham. You'd have to think in the two mile or the two five, um, and going right could be a concern. We've seen it with the Styrian Falange. Yeah, probably goes more drastically to his right than maybe Cham Kylie does. But it doesn't. It's not ideal. It's Which, not. Which would you prefer, two mile or two mile five for him come Cheltenham? Mm. The weaker race. I'd probably be avoiding Fasal Vega myself. Mm. Okay. And which way do you think Fasal Vega will go? Whichever way Willie decides. <laughs> <laughs> two miles, I'd say. This is something we are going to look at in terms of where we expect horses to go later on the series. in the series. We're going to do it later on with the Novice Chasers as well in this show. Right, let's go back to the Lawlers of Nace and talk about the horses that finished second to fifth. Irish Point was second. He finished two points ahe um, places ahead of Champ Keeley at um, at Kylie, sorry, at, at in the Royal Bond. Um, this was another good run in second. Yeah, fourth last. Well, it's actually the second last. They jump. He misses it there on the outside in the Rob Core colours, and then when they get away from the third last hurdle. Dawn rising the white cap is flat to the boards on the inside. Grange Care West. He looks to be travelling all right, but he doesn't find too much. Now Kalanisi star in the navy and orange. He's about to drop out of the shot. Monbeg Park drops out of the shot, which to me suggests they're going to really go gallop because they're strong stairs. Cham Kiley's still in front. Grange Care West gets himself out there to attack Chak Cham Kiley, but he can't get any closer. He looks one-paced and Danny keeps winding it up in front. Ch uh, Irish Point, Lydia, 
could he possibly go back in trip? He did look like he had plenty of gears in the Royal Bond, whereas the rest, and especially the horse in the white cap, Dawn Rising, he comes from fifth to plug on to be third, getting in front of um, you know Grace Clare West, thinking. and you know the way I'm think, you know what you're thinking. So probably the stare out of him is Dawn Rising. I'd say Blaine Square West was disappointed. Um, Irish Point could go down a trip. Yes, and I think Gordon Elliott was talking potentially about doing that with Irish Point, maybe missing the Dublin Racing Festival. Three runs over hurdles, two seconds in grade ones. Uh, no reason why he wouldn't be suited by the old curse at Cheltenham. He should run well, and because he's been defeated twice, he might be too big a price for his form. Yeah, he probably will be. He probably will be. Like he, like again, like, like uh, Cham Kiley in the Royal Bond, he probably got involved soon enough. Dawn Rising, full brother to the Irish Derby winner, Sovereign. I think he's not Albert Bartlett horse. Well... Yeah, further anyway. <laughs> and you know the way I'm thinking, uh, I know the way you're thinking even, that he's still in progressing, definitely, improving in his own world. Like from winning that winner's hurdle at Scoring Park, we would imagine it was definitely a big step forward. And finally, Grange Crow West, the vet at NACE reported afterwards that he was coughing um, and blowing hard. He was also hanging in the closing stages. He looked like he got very tired, very empty. Uh, mm. Why he was coughing, I don't know, but I'd say they were all blown hard. Yeah. Seven years of age, though, and three yeah. starts under rules. Not, not, not the profile for me, I'm afraid. Right, OK, let's move to Sandown the previous day and have a look at the Tollworth. First of all, we're going to measure it up against the Juvenile and the Two Mile Handicap, just to get a general idea of how this race was run compared to the other two. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. They go a really good gallop in the Tallworth. It looked like they did on the day as well. Tallworth, top of your shot. Obviously, juvenile, bottom left. Handicap hurdles on the bottom right. But when they get to the first hurdle, you'll see exactly what we're saying. In the Tallworth hurdle, um, Colonel Harry is going a really good gallop in front. That's the second hurdle. Jumps it. Now the juveniles are coming to it, and the handicap's not far behind. But when we switch into the back straight to the third hurdle, first down the back, you'll see how far the Tallworth's in front. Juveniles want to jump it. Look how far back the handicappers are. They went really steady in the handicap compared to the Tallworth, which was strongly run, and Tamora's ultimately win. Second last hurdle, Tamora's makes a mistake, but I was slightly impressed with I have a voice, Lydia. He thought he jumped really well. It get, he gets there a long way in front of the handicappers, and the finishing times are two seconds and two seconds apart. So the Tallworth was four seconds quicker than the handicap. It was two seconds quicker than the juvenile. Um, and I'd say it's a good performance from Tamouris because he went a strong gallop. It was a strongly run renewal. And, and Sandown on testing ground, I wasn't there, but it looked pretty testing. It can be hard to keep going there. Mm. You've mentioned that before. The key exception, obviously, would be Constitution Hill. You can yeah. look a rare horse that looks impressive at, at Sandown and look what he was. We'll come to the juveniles Look later. On. <laughs> Look what he is. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and what and what he might be. Yeah. We'll come to the juvenile later on in the show. Um, I was quite taken with the run of Colonel Harry as well as Tamuras, but if we look at Tamuras in close-up detail, how, what did you make of what he did? I was impressed with him. I do think he needs to jump a bit better. I think he's still a little bit sloppy, and, and Paul will work on that. Dealing with the first hurdle, it's it's not hurdly. It's I don't know how you describe it. Here they are, Arctic Brazil, third hurdle. He was already struggling on landing. You can see Rachel Blackmore's not happy. He ran no race. This was Tamora's best jump. He was slick there, but he needs to jump more like that. And by the time we got to this hurdle, authorised speed, that's the third last. He's starting to struggle for Jamie Moore. I was impressed with Tamora's, but even this jump, that's very awkward. But I was impressed with how he gets going again in the testing ground. It's hard against the hill at Sandown. And again at the last hurdle, he's far from foot perfect, but he manages to get himself going again. Um, I think it's a good testament of a horse that can lose momentum in testing ground and regain it and this fella does. I've got plenty to pick out of it. I know you like Colonel Harry. Uh, the runner-up, of course, was uh, Lastra Boy. Boy and Neiman, Neiman Lyon is back in third. But, and he drifts across the track, Neiman Lyon. Astro Boy keeps going well. But I thought Tamouris did well to pick up at the back of the second last and at the back of the last to get going again. OK, we've had um, Mick M in touch about it and he's uh, sent this to us. He said everyone shouting about Tamuris at Sandown. And I thought the thought, that's Nami and Lyon, ran with credit on that ground. Maybe Ruby could analyse that race. Well, he just has. I just think the way the race developed with Colonel Harry going madly out to his left and you know setting the pace that he did, the fact that he was only really beaten approaching the final hurdle, in my mind, I'm marking him up for his performance. I imagine they're going to need some recovery time after that, though, aren't they? They all looked at it. The only thing that will be in their favour is it was only two miles, so it wasn't a three-mile race, so 
three mile race even so they should be able to get over it and obviously Richard Patrick looked to drop his reins so the third horse did lose a bit of momentum um, from the last hurdle to the line so I can see why that tweak came in but I'd still be with the winner every day. 138 the official handicapper made to Burris afterwards that means he's got quite a bit to find traditionally to win a supreme novices hurdle. Yeah he probably does there's no doubt he does but um, he can only be handicapped off the horses he beat, and obviously that's the rating that the handicapper has them on. Mm. But I suppose the point I'm making is that Fasal Vega and Champ Kylie have already achieved more, much more. Yeah, the, the Sandown can be a deceptive place. I, I was taken with Tamura's in Haydock, and he didn't disappoint me. Yeah, he's clearly a promising horse. I'm not, I'm not decrying him in any way. Let's have a look at the betting, shall we? Um, this is how the Sky Bet Supreme stands currently. Fasal Vega's odds on. I don't disagree that he should be at the top of the market. I just don't feel he should be odds on. I wouldn't back him at odds on, anyway. Marine Nationale's form in the Royal Bond has clearly been franked, albeit that that was an odd race. He was played last and he won. Yeah, he got a really good ride, but he still did win. And he's um, a horse that likes better ground, so you could argue, easily argue, or Barry Connell can easily argue, that Ferry House was too soft for him. So he did well to win, um, and he probably deserves to be there. Tamoris, I don't think, did anything wrong at the weekend. In Perry Pass, we'll see next weekend. An Irish point is starting to look like value in there, 14 to 1. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. Rare addition as well. Yeah. Uh, I think he's the best two-mile hurdler in Britain at the moment. I, th I think he's, his form probably is stronger than, than Tamuras's, which is, might be a bit heinous given that Tamuras has just won a grade one. Fell out the back of the shot in the Lawler's Hotel. Kalanisi Star beat him in a point of point, didn't they? And there mm. were two cheap horses after that, 60 and 45,000. So much for the 400,000 pound ones. The only thing is that Rare Edition might well be headed to Aintree. I know that Charlie Longson has talked about him maybe being an Aintree horse. So I'm just talking about ability rather than necessarily for the Supreme. Let's have a look at the Ballymore. Hermes Allen, after his victory in the Cello, which was very, very good indeed, is the 5-2 to two favourite. How do you see that market? Yeah, you can't knock Hermes Allen. He's been very, very good and he's a wonderful jumper, Gaelic warrior. Um, he's obviously in the Betfair hurdle, which due to run with Clonmel earlier today, which has been rescheduled to Tuesday. Champ Kylie, yeah, looks the most probable target for him. And Imperia Pass drops back to two miles at the weekend, but were he to win the Moscow Flyer, I have a funny feeling Paul Towner will be trying to be splitting him and Fasai Vegan. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you'd be doing. Have you no doubt I would? <laughs> right, OK. So, as Ruby's just mentioned, there's uh, at least two races this weekend that might impact on those two markets. The first of them is the Grade 2 Moscow Flyer. How do you see this squaring up? I think it'll be a tactical race. Imperia Pass won a 2-2, 187 yards um, maiden hurdle at Nay. So he's dropping back in trip here. Imagine and the Model Kingdom would look the two he's to take on here. But in Perry Pass, as I said, it was a distant race and I don't see an out-and-out front-runner in there other than maybe Tax for Max, but same owner, same trainer. I don't know if the two of those will run. Um, we'll obviously find out tomorrow morning. But look, yeah, it'll be a good trial of in Perry Pass, but he's going to have to be sharper than, than we think he is. OK, well, let's have a quick look at him in Perry Pass and Imagine and Model Kingdom. Um, just to flesh out what Ruby's just been saying. Yeah, look, he took a lead at, at, at Nace, so he sat in behind the pace. Maybe he'll do the same again. Now, I know people are going to say, well, Imagine made the running on his last start. Imagine was forced to make the running in Goran Park. And behind him is, well, back in the white cap is, I like the way you're thinking, who we watched in the, the Lauders last weekend. But he crawled around in front. Jack Kennedy didn't want to make the running on Imagine, and he got done in a dash. And the Model Kingdom at Thurlis and the Mayor's Hurdle on her last start, she sits in. She's a quick filly who likes to be delivered late. So um, I don't see a front runner. I think that Moscow flyer could be tactical. Paul will probably be forced to go on Imperia Pass, but it'll be interesting to see how it suits him. Where do you think that will fall? Who will win? You'd have to be mightily impressed with Imperia Pass mm. at Nace, but I'd be more impressed with him if he can drop two and a half furlongs to a faster track and win a race that's not going to have much pace. Won't Paul have to therefore change that? He will. He'll try and make it, but I'm still not sure he's a leader. He's probably a follower. So I'll be more impressed with him if he can go and do that. OK, I look forward to looking over the Moscow Flyer this time next week. We've also got the Ballymore Leamington Novices Hurdle. That comes at Warwick on Saturday. These are the decks for that. Oh, Landrake is coming over for Gordon Elliott, which is interesting. Yeah, uh, it is interesting. He's a progressive horse who got beaten in a few um, 
bumpers, but one of Maiden Hurl in Clonmel the day we were there, Lydia, and it's in progress since then. It is. Losley Road was your Antipos favourite when I was looking at this um, earlier, and look, he won at Chepstow where he made the running, um, and it's a, it's, look, it is a competitive race, but it'd be interesting to see. Now, it, it, there's a bit of shape to this race. Let's have a look at how we think that is going to pan out. We can take a look at the snake roll first off. Yeah, he dropped right in at, at um, or no, he was keen at Haydock and then went to Newcastle and made the running. So you could see snake roll going forward for Lucinda Russell and Derek Fox. Uh, this is Ginny's destiny who sat just behind the pace of Warwick. So be something similar will be expected again on Saturday afternoon from, from him. And then you had uh, Grey Dawn who dropped right in at Sandown. So, or Kempton even. So Grey Dawn will drop in. But Paul Nichols is nosy road made the run in the Chepstow as well. So you'll have Nosy Road and Snake Roll at the front end. You're going to have Jeannie's Destiny behind the pace and you'll have Harry's Kelton at the back on Grey Donny. I find this race tricky. Do you have a developed view on no. it? No. <laughs> right, let's Definitely be honest. Not. <laughs> well, <laughs> we can talk about it this time next week. That's the Novice Hurdlers. We're going to move on to the Juveniles now. Now, I promised you a closer look at that juvenile at Sandown, won by I Have a Voice. Mombasa was second and Bo Zenith making his debut for Gary Moore and because of his defeat of Blood Destiny, was much was expected of him, but he was well beaten into third. He was, and I Have a Voice, I was really impressed that I Have a Voice is jumping. Jumped out in front, pings the first hurdle and, you know, poaches a considerable lead without having had to do too much. And again, down the back, jumps the third hurdle, really attacks it. Sixth hurdle, same again. And long and low, Bozenet and Mombasa. Bozenet there is the first time that you're thinking that's struggling. Second last, big and high. And look, I said it when we were watching Tamouris. This is a stiff, slow finish. Last hurdle, pings it again. Look, he was two seconds quicker than the handicap. All right, he was two seconds behind the grade one Talworth. But I thought it was a good performance from the winner. I have a voice. I know it didn't blow you away, but I liked the way he went to the line. I loved the way he jumped. I thought it was okay. I think it was a, a well judged ride, uh, bar for the use of the whip when well clear after the last. Yeah, um, I'm not, won't be against that when you're clear and you're starting to stop. I'm not, I've always been, felt that it can be easier to judge somebody, but all it takes is the commentator to say something, the crowd to cheer, and you think, oh, better be safe than sorry. Get a bigger ban for not winning. Okay. So it's only my humble opinion. You, you, you don't think that there should be that rule? I don't know about the rule. I think it could often be off or over enforced. Okay, okay. I think the jumping was the asset, wasn't it? Just, yeah. just massive. Um, and then, Bo Zenith, what do you make of that? We're going to see Blood Destiny uh, this weekend. Yeah, um, look, he's a big reputation, but look, maybe it was just too heavy for him, too soft for him. But he was beaten a long way out back in the third last hurdle. I thought Bo Zenith was struggling. And of course, Gary Moore has got Jupiter de Gite, who is very impressive against older horses in lesser company. Oh, no, no in, in good company, actually, at uh, Newbury. Jet powered, well beaten in that race. Well beaten in that yeah. race, yeah. Uh, right, there were a couple of other juvenile races that we need to look at. Two divisions of a juvenile hurdle, maiden hurdle at Taunton. Start with Rare Middleton. Yeah, and look, Paul Nichols, Harry Cobden won both divisions at his race at Taunton. Rare Middleton got a lead early. They went a really good gallop. To me, Rare Middleton looked more of a horse for the future. He's clean, he jumps rather than hurdles. Um, it was a pleasing start. He was well fancied, a bit to his right um, at the third hurdle in the back straight. But to the second last hurdle, he's absolutely canter. And he obviously gives Harry Cobden the feel that there's loads under the tank because he wins here doing as little as possible. Like This is a handicap, you'd be delighted with him. But it wasn't, it was a maiden hurdle. He only goes and wins an neck or a half a length on him without getting overly serious. So he obviously felt that Rare Middleton had a lot under the bonnet. Um, the form, I don't know, but of the two that we watched last Monday at Paul's, this looked like the one with the longer future. Mm. Maybe I'm wrong, but when you watched them, that's what I felt. I liked the, the promise. I feel, feel like he's not a now horse, but no. his stable knight, Affidil, who won the other division of this four-year-old upwards maiden, I think he is a now horse. He could be a now horse, but he's going to be a lot of school in ditch heat. <laughs> I have a funny feeling this fella could spend a lot of time in the ring down there. Um, <laughs> but he goes to the first hurdle in ditch heat. No one's keen to make the run and saw Harry Cobden looking for a four-timer. Bucks out in front and Affidil down to the first hurdle. And Affidil, there's no doubt, has seen hundreds of jumps in ditch heat. I can guarantee you that. But um, when you watch him at the first hurdle, you think, whoa, has he ever seen one? Um, down he goes in the vault colours in front. Harry gives him a tap on his right with right hand, ducks across with his left, goes to refuse. Lucky for him, there's a horse outside him, and that kind of gets him to the jump and over it. And then Harry quickly reverts to getting the lead and sits in in second place. But Affidil was quite deliberate again at the second hurdle. Now, after making that kind of mistake, runs around and has a look. And at the third hurdle, it was 
again really slow he mm. jams on and spends a bit of time in the air so look jumping is going to have to it's like a pony out in the field wasn't he having a pop at that one but look second last hurdle after warming up jumps it well and then wins in a common canter um, from Mammy's boy and Danton back in third I like the performance the funny feeling Clifford Baker and Harry Cobden will be doing a lot of school with this lad yeah I like the fact that he got better as the race developed well it's going, to. To be, it's going to be hard to get worse. <laughs> I think that's probably fair. It'll be interesting to see. I, I think Paul was talking about the champion uh, going to sorry the, to Haydock with this horse next and keeping the two of them apart. He looked like the Adonis horse to me more than Rare uh, Middleton. Yeah, but obviously they're watching him at home. Uh, Rare Middleton was a good bit shorter in the betting than Affidil was, so maybe he shows them more. Let's have a look at the betting in terms of where we stand with the JCB Triumph Hurdle. As I said, we'll focus more fully on the juveniles later on in the series. Lossy Mouth after two wins, towers over the rest in the betting and also so far in form. She hasn't encountered a strongly run race yet and she beat her stable companion Gallimasso last time. Any thoughts there? Not really. I mean, there's not a whole pile developed since Christmas, but we'll see them all again in Dublin Racing Festival. Lossy Mouth, Gallimasso, I'm assuming Zarek the Brave, they're all bounce off each other there. Of course, scriptwriters put up quite a nice performance on the flat at Wolverhampton yeah. since we last saw him, and that yeah. was a pretty decent effort. Let's move on to the Brudels Fred Winter. Now, this is all over the place, as you would expect it to be. 8-1 to one co at the moment. I mean, your guess is as good as mine as far. Do you have a view? I, I don't. No, no, no. The one thing we should point out is there's been a rule change, hasn't there, in terms of the hurdles, uh, some of the hurdles at Cheltenham. Handicaps, but not no, the rest of the handicaps require four runs now for novices to get a mark. Hurdles four runs only. over hurdles, yeah. Uh, four, four, yeah, four. Uh, whereas the Boodle's Fred Winter is still three. So don't be thinking horses aren't qualified because they've only had three runs. The juveniles are still qualified for the Fred Winter with three. OK, that's the juveniles this week. I'll tell you what, you'd have to give uh, Champ Kylie a right chance at the festival now, wouldn't you? Uh -huh. Yeah, he'd have, a, he'd have a great chance in the champion bumper. Oh, because um, they said to take out some of the hurdles. Yeah, there's it? no hurdles, so it's more like a bumper, wasn't it? Mm. I've, yeah, I've heard that one before. Yeah, you can always rely on Willie Mullins in the bumper. The bumper, yeah. Always yeah. rely on him. Still going with the old bumper ah, gag. Zinger, if you're there anyway, off to back the double of Fasal Vega at Constitution Hill. Thanks for the info. Keep, keep it to yourself. Yeah, will do, appreciate it. If you don't mind. Entries are published this week for the Unibet Champion Hurdle, the Close Brothers David Nixon's Mayors Hurdle and the Paddy Power Stayers Hurdle. We'll get onto those in a moment. But we asked you a question about the Stayers Hurdle because there were a few left field entries. Here's the question. Which of these interests you most in the Stayers Hurdle? Asturian Falange, Huick, Gilino Bello, Shaq and Passoir, or if we've missed out your choice, tell us yours. Which would you have voted for, Ruby? With regards to interest, which one could you see winning? Of those, probably only Hewick. Juliana Bello might be overpriced. I mean, we're assuming Blazing, Blazing Cal is going to get there. and I, I know we were assuming that Juliana Bello runs assuming a hell of a lot. Um, but I just would think of those horses there, the one that is on an upward trajectory is still Hewick. Yeah. You said, our survey said, <coughs> a steering for Lange, of course. The siren that calls you onto the rocks season after season. Of course, Asterian Falange would win this vote. Ahead of Shaq and Passoir, who's entered everywhere. Hewick and Julino Bello. You're, you're not impressed, I can, I can see. Right, let's have a look at your views as well, shall we? We'll start with South Shield Sports Fan, who nominated that Monkfish would be the most interesting one. Wouldn't he be more likely to run over hurdles without a prep run rather than the Gold Cup? Um. I wouldn't think so. No, I'd say if he if he gets there, if big if if he gets there, I'd I'd have thought he'd run the Gold Cup. Okay, Buzz is the next one that had got you talking. Paul Brown talking about him. Of course, we haven't seen him since November 2021 when he went at Ascot. Sadly, after that, he fractured his pelvis. He won the Cesarevich a month earlier as well. Fractured pelvis. Taken a long time. Must have been pretty severe. So. Yeah, look, he's re recoverable from. Um, he's a high-class horse, and he's there. And then Scott Rutherham, who is a regular correspondent to the show, he goes for Sharjah to do a Nichols Canyon. Interesting. What do you think? I think Nichols Canyon always shaped like a horse that wanted a trip. I think Sharjah's always shaped like a bit of a speedster. 
Okay. Myself, but I hope I'm wrong. As I mentioned, we're going to have a look now at those horses that have been entered for the top grade one hurdles at Cheltenham. We're going to start by looking through the prism of Willie Mullins, just because he was responsible, particularly in the stayers hurdle, for some of the more unexpected entries. You've got a smile on your face. Let's <laughs> let's have a look at them. Were there more than these originally? There might have been. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, what's that? This, this is the champion hurdle. Hardly any surprises there. Sugar Hard hasn't run yet this season, so he was always going to be entered. And the other four look fairly obvious, I'd say. Yeah, and we'll have a look at some of these, particularly Brandy Love, in a few moments' time. But if we switch on to the stayers, uh, those are interesting. They are. Um, Asterian for launch, look, maybe. Um, didn't look like he was staying in the King George and he fell to me. Shaq and Pursois has never tried the distance and jump him as he's forte. Not sure he's going to be a better hurdler myself. Oton Kalur. Possibly. Monkfish has to get there. Sharjah has to settle. Well, not Sharjah, St. Sam even has to settle. Sharjah has to stay. And Sir Gerhard will have to prove he stays as well. Now, the matter of Sir Gerhard, this le leads us nicely in. It had been given out that he'd had a setback and that he might not be able to be taking part at all this season. He'd been planning for a novice chasing. What's the latest on him? I think it was indicated that he'd, be, he'd miss a couple of weeks. So, look, he's not entering the beginner's chase at Ferry House this weekend. The next beginner's chase for him is on the 21st of January at Navin. That's over three miles. I'd be shocked if he goes there. Um, he's more likely he would be looking at Gorham Park on the 26th, which is two miles, or the following Saturday at Ferry House, which is two and a half. But um, I think that's where he'd be getting entered. That's the plan, heading him that direction. Anyway. And so in terms of those hurdles entries, they're kind of safety nets, are they? I'd say they are. I mean, it's what do you do now? I mean, it's, you're coming to the end of January. Like, you're only going to run now, maybe chat. You're going to, you know, three runs as a novice. So do you, do you stay hurdling? Do you go chasing? Um, I'm just trying to think. I think Keyless Emery won that beginner's chase in Gordon Tayest this day. And the grey horse was just behind him. They went down to win the Arkle after the Paul Road. Um, that ended up in Paul Nichols's. Jared Sullivan's colours. Duke de Geneve. Duke de Geneve. Yeah, Duke de Geneve. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Okay, um, got him. Sorry. So, look, yeah, maybe he will, but I would say that that's when you see him at the end of the month. Um, so you're kind of in the appreciate it problem, aren't you? You are. You're betwixt and between. So, I'd say when Willie assesses how exactly he's going, he'll probably make a decision. What would you do? I mean, you know the horse. What do you think of him? Well, what I do, this stage. <sighs> Well, Constitution Hill wasn't around, I'd head for the champion hurdle, but Constitution Hill is around. <laughs> so, um, what's he most likely to win? I don't know. I'd say it's, I couldn't see him winning the stairs. Would he stay? Was he won at Ballymore? I believe in it fluid. See what happens to everybody else. That is the right answer, I suspect. <laughs> if, if Willie Wellens is watching, which he won't be, uh, he'd think that's the right answer. Right, Mad for It has this question for you. It's not... He's not the only person who's asked about it. Brandy Love. What's the gen on Brandy Love? What's the what? Gen. Information. Latest. Gen. All right. Yeah. Um, that's lingo from where? Wolverhampton. <laughs> <laughs> not bad. <laughs> Wolverhampton. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, Brandy Love. Brandy Love's working away and Brandy Love has a distinct like, likeness for going... Uh, left-handed watch her here she heads off out to her left love envoy whore pieced over on the far side of the track but look this mare will definitely be better going left-handed she is getting to a point where she's getting ready to run but there's not many mares races for her going left-handed i think there's one in doncaster i was about to mention the, the one in doncaster yeah i'm not sure she'll go there but why i don't know she'll be ready to go to england first run right. just at the end of this month um but she'll be ready for Cheltenham the way she's going and that Willie Mullins has won that mare's sword a few times. When, not when, given once, or twice. once or twice, yeah. So a positive update on um, Brandy Love. Let's talk about She Wears It Well beating Queen's Brook. Uh, Dow Jacob and I had a look at it last week, but I think it's worth hearing your perspective on She Wears It Well. Now, she uh, suffered quite a significant injury. She broke some bones in her face, I yeah, think. Yeah, she did, and she's taken a long time to come back to herself, but it just shows you what winning can do to a horse. So she won a Pertemps qualifier at Punchestown, and then she stepped up here. Now, on the book, she was entitled to win here. She was three pounds well in with Queen's Brook, who gets left in front away from the third last hurdle, which doesn't really suit Queen's Brook. Um, or here's the third 
last hurdle, sorry, and Paul Townend put a target on Jack Kennedy's back and followed him around. But I loved what She Wears It Well does and Paul eventually gets after. Queensbrook jumps the second last, but she's idle in front and doesn't go away. Now, when she's odds on, Queensbrook has looked vulnerable at times is when you seem, you seem to forget about her that she goes and wins or runs her best races and Cheltenham being that one last year but when Paul grabs a hold of she wears it well here she gives him the right indication but she shoots through on Jack's inside going to the bypass last hurdle and she quickens up really well good performance from her she's up to rating of 143 she was entitled to win this I haven't checked the penalty but she's definitely going the right way she was still a little hesitant at her hurdles and probably no you- harm because she should have been hesitant before and she wasn't <laughs> Willie was talking as he was watching there, maybe putting cheek pieces on her. Isn't she going to have to sharpen up if she's really going to take part in the mare's hurdle at Cheltenham? She is, but I'd say she's starting to go in the right direction. And I'd say winning the Pertemps was a good step forward for her, got her head in front and won. Paul was brilliant on her on the day, but it just shows you a bit of confidence and she was better again at Leperstown. OK. Let's consider Willie Mullins's interesting entries in the Stayers Hurdle now, starting with... You're obsessed with this one. I am obsessed with Asterian Falange. He's, he's, the, he's one of the characters that kind of makes the jump season for me. So Asterian Falange that's called everybody onto the rocks. What do you think of his view <laughs> chances in the Stayers Hurdle? Well, I think of his chance in the Stayers Hurdle. I'm not sure he stays. Here he is in the Supreme. He heads off right um, and knocks over the big chestnut horse to JP's. Um, Captain Guinness gets brought down. But look, he's definitely going left-handed. Doesn't suit him he's a better horse going right handed more he did galloping go back. track on the new course yeah I know that but he did go, yeah, more galloping track is probably the worry he did go back and run ok in a novice chase at Cheltenham mm. but I don't think he was staying in the King George I think he was well beaten by Tornado Flyer and going to get out today when he fell I'm not sure he'd get the trip ok and how about St Sam who was second in the Fred Beatles Fred Winter when he ran in it. He unseated in the Arkle last season and last time we saw him was at Punchestown, over the weekend. Yes, Punchestown, that's right. New Year's Eve. Um, and I thought he won he won well on that occasion. But he is keen. Paul Town and Rodham, he goes along in front and he takes a fair old bite on this occasion of Paul. And he, you know, he's gonna have to settle better to get three miles at the Cheltenham Festival. But look you've um, run for Oscar in second, and he's second now, comes on to finish second, then run for Oscar, and Somerville Boy is about to come to jump the last hurdle now for Rachel Blackmore, having his first run for Henry de Bromhead. It was a pleasing comeback from St. Sam, but would I be certain he'd get the trip at Cheltenham the way he races? It could be hard. Good that you mentioned Somerville Boy, because he's got an entry in the Sayers hurdle as well for Henry de Bromhead. used to be with Tom George, of course, won the 2018 Supreme. He's going to be needing to do a lot better than that, and he's 11 years of age now, I think. He is, not getting any younger. No, none of us are, I have to tell you. Thanks. Just a fact. Uh, Let's have a look at the other stables and the news from the entries regarding those starting with the champion hurdle for which there were 17 entries and the one that really catches your eye is Somerville Boy's new stable companion or he is the new stable companion of Bob Ollinger. We saw Bob Ollinger in the Jack de Bromhead Christmas hurdle they're now going to try two miles they were thinking about the Matheson right up until declaration time what do you think about Bob Ollinger's over two miles for the champion hurdle? It's just the last roll of the dice isn't it? Um, or not the last roll of the dice what do you do? It is a bit. Look, it is a bit I suppose. Look he's still the horse that was very impressive in the Ballymore when he beat Brave Man's Game and um, whatever else but look that engine was in there and I'm sure connections are hoping it's still in there. It looked like it was when he came back in the Liz Mullen. I was never convinced by him as a chaser last year and I thought watching him in the Liz Mullen for most of the race, from the third last down to the second last, but even through the race, how he travelled, he was keen again, you're thinking, well, he could be back and then ultimately, mm. home by the league come and, comes and does him. So you're thinking, mm, did he stay, did he need it? But when you watched him in Leperstown at Christmas, from a long way out, you were never thinking he's going to win. So to me, it's a roll of the dice, it's a shot in the dark. What have you to lose? Um, I should also mention that Zana here, last year's third, is entered in the champion hurdle. He's also in the stayers. The staying project doesn't seem to be going that well at the moment. No. And Jason the Militant, who is now with Phil Kirby, formerly with Henry de Bromhead, uh, changed hands, um, I think, for £50,000. I think I'm right in saying that. Um, he is also entered. 
But we should talk about Love Envoy because she has got an entry in the champion hurdle. She's also obviously in the mayor's hurdle and that seems to be her primary target. She won at, at Sandown on Saturday and how she won. She was really impressive. She was really impressive. And look, Johnny Burke lined her up in this race to take his time. Uh, Bally Callum fame went, was in front. Martello Sky is obviously the grey and Johnny dropped in at the back aboard Love Envoy to try and get her to switch off and ride her for, ride her for a bit of speed, I suppose. Um, like she had won over two miles at Cheltenham last year. Um, Venetia Williams' horse is down the inside uh, fought to net and Johnny after a while eventually gets in behind Charlie Deutsch and looks like he has this mare sort of switched off now they went a decent enough gallop it was testing enough ground up by the winning posture thinking Johnny has her in a nice pocket here and he's going to follow these around but when she runs down to the hurdle away from the stands after the descent away from the stands round into the back straight she comes alive going to that first hurdle with him and Johnny just lets her go wings by Fortinet and lands into third place gets to the next hurdle she's already gone by Martella Sky and lands half upsides in front um, and she never comes off the bridle from there home personally I think if you're dropping one in you should say dropped in there's not much point in passing them at halfway, um, but this mare does go and win really well, and I was impressed by her. Do I think she's a champion hurdle mare? Probably not, but I think she's a huge player in the mare's hurdle. Did, did Levenbois give Johnny Burke any choice about? He's riding her. Ride her. Let's have a look at the impact on the Close Brothers mare's hurdle betting, shall we? Marie's Rock, after her win beating the Geldings in the Rail Keel, is favourite at 11 to 4. Quite rightly, after that performance, Love Envoy is 4 to 1. Brandy Love, we've discussed, fives. Now, there are Epitant and Honeysuckle, and there's a story to tell with each of those, isn't there? Uh, because when we saw the entries for the Crows Brothers Mayor's Hurdle, there was one that we expected not to be there. That was Honeysuckle, given Peter Maloney's comments, which we'll show you in a moment at the weekend. And there's one that we were expecting to be there, that was Epitant, but she wasn't there because of a clerical error. Yeah, look, everyone makes mistake, mistakes, and some cost more than others. This is going to cost Nikki about 3,900 and something. <laughs> To supplement? Well, it's going to cost four and a half to supplement, but had you gone the traditional route, it would cost you 600 to run. So you mm -hmm. take one off the other, and the difference is 3,900. Thank you very something. much. Thank you very much for explaining that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I give him a clip. Let's hear from <laughs> let, let's hear from Peter Maloney, shall we? He's the racing manager to Kenny Alexander and the owner of Rathmore Stud. And this is what he told Gary O'Brien about Honeysuckle at Nace on Sunday. Listen, the whole thing is, if you know, she's uh, she's been a wonderful servant to us. Uh, she owes us nothing, and you know, if she's not up, and Kenny said this last year before she's ever beaten or anything like that. If she wasn't running to what we think, you know, is her optimum, you know, she'll be retired, and that's the story. So it'll be champion hurdle or retire, one or the other. And let that be. Oh, you're back. Okay. Uh, well, what did you make <laughs> of what Peter? had to say that I think that's right personally that it, it fully it, agree yeah if you're if you're you know it all depends on the Irish champion hurdle yeah. and if she is good enough runs well enough to contest the champion hurdle that's where she goes she's a dual winner she shouldn't be messing around with the mares I think she's going to have to win what does she have to gain by nothing no Sorry. she's got a lot to lose as well I did potentially. say it. I agreed you can trash it out all you want but I fully agree with Peter Maloney and with you <laughs> I've just scared him now right we saved the Matheson for you. We didn't talk about it last week. So let's hear your take on Stateman beating Vauban meeting, beating Charger. I think, being realistic, Stateman and Vauban, if they're going to get into the same county as Constitution Hill, had to beat Charger. It's pretty simple. She's electric, we always thought would make the running, and she does. Paul Townend lets her off. Vauban's a bit keen early. Danny eventually gets him back behind Charger, but second hurdle, they jump Charger, uncharacteristically makes a really bad mistake, which you can factor then into his run. Now, Paul left, she's electric, a couple of lengths in front of him to lead him as long as he could. I thought Stateman jumped much better, but she's electric with her rate and was only ever going to lead him to sort of the third last hurdle and Paul has to go by her after they line that. Now he drags Sharjah and Vauban, but when this camera changes, keep your eye on Pied Piper. He's starting to come off the bridle. But look where he is by the time he got around the bend. He's completely tailed off. He bust punctured. Vauban has to fight his way through and Sharjah's inside going to the bend as Danny's trying to have a go at Paul. And Danny does get to close enough to Paul to have a go. Patrick elects to come straight when they bypass the last hurdle, whereas Paul and Danny go back onto the far side of the track. Danny has a look on Paul's inside there. Paul doesn't give him an inch and he has to switch. I thought statement was impressive. I don't think Paul asked him a huge question. From memory, and I haven't watched it in over 10 days, I don't even think he even hits uh, 
statement. He keeps his hands on the reins, rides him hands and heels. He thinks there's plenty in the tank. Vauban ran really well for his first run since Punchestown last year. But they both, to me, had to finish in front of Sharjah to even think about taking yes. it on Constitution Hill. I just wish hadn't Sharjah hadn't made the mistake to give it even more credit. So you'd have more of a measure, you'd understand better what would happen yeah. in that scenario. I, I think they, you know, William Mullins' team have got to be really keen from about statement as well. He jumped meta, so that was improvement yeah. from, from the previous time from the Morgiana. And for Vauban, first run of the season as a four-year-old, uh, soon to turn five, taking on older horses, that was really substantial yeah, to me. Yeah, it was. And look, with a bit of luck, he'll improve from the Madison to the Irish champion hurdle, and he should be able to improve again by the time he gets to Cheltenham in March and be improving to April. But... Constitution Hill will be waiting. <laughs> yes, he towers over this. We can have a look at the betting for the Unibet Champion Hurdle. Of course, hopefully Honeysuckle uh, will be there. Constitution Hill 4-11. to 11. State Man identified as 4-1 to 1 clear favourite. Of the ones that might be a bit of juice, and it might be Vauban, comparatively. Is it going to be a tough decision, potentially, for Paul Tannen between those two? Um, very hard to get off State Man after winning his last two grade ones, even if Vauban entitled to make improvement, that'd be a huge call. He'd have uh, to beat him, wouldn't one, he, now at Champion Little? two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's eight there. I, I think, like, if Honeysuckle wins at the Dublin Racing Festival, she's going to be a clear second favourite. So her there at that price, at eight to one, she's an each way better at the minute. OK. Let's look next at the Stayers Hurdle. There's some interesting entries. We've already mentioned one of them, and that is Buzz. In fact, we've already mentioned two of them, Hewix in there as well. But Marie's Rock on the right-hand side, this is interesting. She's got an entry here as well as in the Mares. She has, and obviously she beat Queensbrook in it last year, came back then to Punchstown and won there, and has kept progressing since. Do I think she'll run the stairs? No, she's not going to run the stairs. No, it doesn't seem to be that way. It seems to be as though the um, mayor's hurdle is the primary target. I think they might have. I think from what I took from what Nicky Henderson was saying, that had he tried three miles earlier, and he had hoped that he would be able to, but things didn't pan out that way. It might have been a more realistic option. But it seems now that as she's starting the rail keel, it will be the two and a half mile trip. Yeah. Um, who else do I need to talk about? Blazing Cal. Are you starting to worry whether he's going to get there? Oh, you'd have to be. Um, but look, you could say the same. I'm not involved in Charles Burns' camp, but people are probably thinking the same about Sir Gerhard and Brandy Love. Um, but Blazing Cal, yeah, will he get there, won't he? Look, if he can, it's still going to be a hard race to win without a run, the stairs hurdle. I think it is. And it'll be the same task that's facing Monkfish in the Gold Cup without having a, had a run in God knows how long. Oh, that'll be huge training performances if those horses can do that. Why did you think Hewick was the best option? I think Hewick's still improving. He's low and he's accurate. Um, and I think every run for Hewick has been better than his last run. And he's still on an upward curve. I think, I think he'd be. A, I think he's tailor made for the Grand National, but I mm. still think he's going. Where is Hugh ceiling? I don't know. No. Are we anywhere near it? No, I don't know either. Goshen, your your mate. Yeah, look, I was keen from to have a go at three miles. Didn't quite get it at at Kempton, but I couldn't have him going left handed at Shelton. Three horses that weren't there that I thought, or some of us thought, perhaps might be there. That no safety entry for Time Hill. Uh, Ahoy Senor, that was Jane Mangan's suggestion on our on the road show at Road to Sheltenham, might get an entry here. And we thought that Maxim, the impressive winner of the handicap at Leopardstown, might yeah, get an entry. We're but just no. looking for a dark one. Um, obviously, Gordon doesn't think he's that dark and hasn't elected to give him an entry. And Champ missing as well. Mm, yes, good point. He's obviously going to entry. Mm. Right, let's have a look at the betting for the Paddy Power Stairs hurdle. So, Flooring Porter. Gavin Cromwell says he wished he'd gone a little bit faster in the in the Christmas hurdle. Do you think that was tactical or do you think that was just how the horse was feeling at the time? Feeling. How many false starts was there? Mm. Three, four attempts to start the race and Florian Porter never crashed through the tape once. I don't think he went at all in Leperstown, Florian Porter. I was never happy with how he was going. The tactical, he was going to need a route in the guts to go faster for a horse that usually can't hold. I was disappointed with him and I can't believe... Home by the Lee is not favourite. The, the best three mile form is Paisley Park's win. Yes. The best form in that list it comes from Chihupo, doesn't it? Beating, win, winning in the Hatton's Grace? Yeah, it does. Classical dream. Um, honeysuckle. It's just his age. Mm. Is he old enough? Maybe he is. And the ground as well, maybe? I think he'll handle deep. it. I'd say he's a very good horse to Hoopo, but um, I'd be concerned with him being robust enough. Okay. Well, we'll find out more about these during the remaining weeks. We need to head on to the Novice Chasers next. 
So let's talk about the novice chasers now. Appreciate it took his second steps, Ruby, over fences. This was at Nace on Sunday. He didn't have a terrible lot to beat. And sadly, the postscript of the race was that Jack Kennedy broke his leg in two places and that sadly his mount, Top Bandit, lost his life. Yeah, not a great ending to any race, but um, what more could a Preciate do when he win the race he was running in? And yeah, look, he did it, jumped the first really well for Paul, goes to the second fence, Paul gives him a squeeze and he actually puts down, which he did in Punchestown as well, but he knows how to get himself out of it. He's very quick at it. Uh, fifth fence then, which is the ditch opposite the stands. He has a good cut at that and Paul gives him a squeeze, so he's well able to do it. Um, then the seventh fence, the next ditch round the bend, they're so strung out it's hard to really know. I mean, they're trying to keep four horses in a shot that really can't fit in um, as he jumps that ditch. And only two irrelevant. Yeah, exactly. It would have been lovely to be zoomed in on them. Um, but what more can appreciate it do? Swings into the home straight, jumps the second last well. Paul obviously comes stand side. You can see why Lydia, after walking that chase course at the weekend, as the white horses keep wide around this, and jumps the last well and wins in the common canter. Where he goes, what's he do next? Probably depends on some of his stable mates, I would imagine. Yes, I asked Paul afterwards whether he was as idle as he said he was on his debut, and he said yes he was. Yeah, and he looked it, um, and I asked him the same on, on Tuesday morning. Um, I'd say he's itching to ride him in a competitive race. Where he can take a lead? Even that it's competitive, it's horses with him, making him go, making him doing it, a better race. Yeah, I'd say get a lead would be ideal. Okay. I said that we'd have a look at where the standings are at the moment, particularly amongst the novice divisions. And this week we're looking at the novice chasers. Time form ratings, these are on the right hand side. And you, you can see your favourites for yourself. At the moment, they've got Mighty Potter, the Drinmore winner, as the best at 162 plus, just a pound ahead of John Bond, the Henry VIII winner, at 161 plus. All of those uh, novices have various ideal trips, obviously. And there's a second page of them as well. You can see that Willie Mullins dominating the first page, but. A very small number of trainers largely dominating these. Um, we'll come back to the real whacker for Patrick Nevin later on. But Ruby, I wanted you to sort of say how you see the various distances amongst the novices panning out at the moment and which horses from those lists that all beyond have impressed you most. Plenty of them. There's a lot of horses there within 12, 13 pounds of themselves on time form. So, like from Mighty Potter at the top all the way to the bottom of that page, there's a huge cluster of what appear to be decent chasers. Now, how many of them will step from there up to 170 ish to be a, a graded horse next year? I mean, time will tell. But to me, actually, John Bond sets the standard. Yeah, I over agree. Mighty Potter. Yeah. I was really taken with him, and he was brilliant in the Henry VIII, Pings the last. And the runner up can't have done anything, only enhanced the form. Dysart Dynamo. He's still dice our dynamo. I'm still remembering Cheltenham last year. El Fabiolo doesn't need to do that too many times if he's going to get up to John Bond's grade. And here you have St. Roy coming to beat Field Door at Leprosound. 2 1 around Leprosound, Field Door, ditch here, steps into the middle of it. He's not going to need to do that too often. Um, and maybe he'll learn from that mistake. Mighty Potter, he was really good in the Drin, in the Drin Moor when he beat Guyard de Menil, but Mighty Potter had the benefit of a run over Guyard de Menil and James de Burley couldn't do any more than what he did probably at Ferry House, but he probably is the one with the most improved. That was the weakest race. Jerry Colom beat adamantly chosen authorised art and killed Crot at Limerick. I think even though that was two three or two three and a bit. I think Jerry Colomb could be the one that steps right up in trip. Definitely. Um, and Mighty Potter probably sets the standard at the middle distance, having won two and a half in both down Royal and Ferry House. So it's unlikely he'll come back towards the Arkle. So the Arkle at the minute would leave you John Bond, Dysart, Dynamo. El Fabiola, maybe. Appreciate it. And really appreciate put, it. Yeah. I, I just can't see them all being in one race. So which, which one's split to go two and a half? El Fabiolo, he definitely is the one that has to brush up in his jumping most. How impressed were you with James DeBurley? Obviously, we heard from Daryl, who was on board last week. What did you think from the outside? What did Daryl think? <laughs> he said that the horse basically ran away with him in the early stages. He was so fresh after such a long time um, off that he was really keen to do it. You could see from the from watching the horse that he really locked onto his fences. Though he's you know he's, he wants to jump them. You could see that. And Daryl said that he was seeking to educate him too. Yeah, he's look. He is. Um, he is a good jumper. He's all, he's a small, handy, light horse, but he's really athletic. Um, and look, same colours as Il Fabiolo, so they're going to split as well. So which way do they go? Time will tell. For me, Mighty Potter's still got to improve his jumping a bit, because when he was in front, three, I think it was four out, three out? Four out, three out, and I think again a two out, but again, a bit like appreciated, I think as the races get more competitive, Mighty Potter will get better too. 
And I don't want to forget about Banbridge just yet. I was really no. impressed with the runs at the wins at Gorin at Cheltenham. I just don't think he was himself for whatever reason in the Drinmore. Ground. Quick reappearance, ground, could have been a load of things. Yeah, but I'd say ground being a key thing. I think when it dries up in the spring, it'll really suit Banbridge. Yeah, I'll knock that, compl that run is completely erased from my mind as far as Banbridge is concerned. Now, whilst you were away last week, I put up the real whacker for the Brown advisory. What did you make of him, A, at Cheltenham, and B, for the Brown advisory? Yeah, look, he's beat, beat my morale well in the old dipper, whatever it's called now. Um, still called the dipper, I think. still called the dipper, is. is it? He's a good, solid jumper anyway. Um, jumped the last really well, the real whacker. Maybe will be. Just testing ground. Again, as the ground dries, is the real whacker going to need to go a little bit further? Oh yeah, definitely. definitely. I want him to. Yeah. Three miles. Three miles, yeah. I'd agree with that, sorry. Then keep changing the leading race names. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely stepping up in trip, I think, could be of interest. Yeah. Um, Pat Neville's t talked about maybe the Gold Cup. Hopefully it will be the brown advisory, though. Um, why the, the Gold rush? Cup this year? Yeah, he's, in the, he's got an entry. Why the rush? What age is he? Seven. I think he's seven. Shoot for the stars. A bit quick. I mean, you know, particularly in a, in a year where there are lots of horses that are graduating out of novice company in their second season and are you know the next generation coming up they look to be anyway yeah i've got another race for you to analyze and that is the mare's beginner's chase it was won by tell me something girl she beat anstey now it was a race slightly depleted because sky ace and bryce hill were withdrawn and it was a race that wasn't short on errors even if it was short on runners uh, it was look here my go your go um who wants to miss the next one wasn't it um look first fence the ball jump but well anstey tell me something girl second fence anstey lands out in her head in front jumps it and pecks out that's her first mistake then you get to the fourth fence tell me something and girl decides she's going to hit this a good dunt, lands out in her head. Fifth fence, the auntie says it's my turn now, we, again, lands out in her head. We go round the bend now and go to the sixth, uh, tell me something girl, jams on into the corner, very, very careful, and does the same at the next fence, was it? Yep, yeah, has another good look at that one. To get across onto the other side of the track now, well, they were all good across the bottom, but second last, tell me something girl, puts down and misses it, and then honestly has the upper hand, she decides no. It's my turn to make a mistake and she lands completely flat footed at the last and tell me something girl back into it. Um, it was extraordinary to watch. How many mistakes can you make in a race? And they finished in slow motion. As slow motion as Champ Kylie was, they looked to be walking up the street yeah. in this race. Yeah, definitely. And afterwards, Peter Maloney, who's the racing manager, as I mentioned earlier, to owner Kenny Alexander, he was talking about, understandably, maybe the mayor's hurdle, given the, the jumping performance of, of, of the winner, and she is entered uh, in that race. You can understand why. Yes. Um, let's have a look at the tweet. Uh, this is from Donny. Now, I wanted to mention this tweet because he voted in Analyze This for Rachel Blackmore uh, for her ride on Tell Me Something Girl, given the way the horse jumped. What would you say? Go back on the horse. No, the, no, the Rachel's ride on Tell Me Something. Oh, girl. she did well to stay on her. There's no doubt about that. Um, but she made as many mistakes as Anstey and the best horse won the race. Um, I see it differently. I mean, uh, yeah, she gave her a very good ride, but. But the, the the main the main foot the main footnote about the race was the was the mistake. Yeah, I think the best horse still won, and the second best horse made as many bad. There's many errors. At least a couple of significant novice chases this weekend. This is the one at Punchestown on Sunday. How do you yeah, see this? Plenty of pace. Gentleman's game, Glen Gooley, Hador, Manila Cooner. A lot of pace in that race could set up for impervious. And meanwhile, at Warwick the previous day, we have a forerunner field for the eventmasters.co.uk Hampton novice. Surely, surely it's Gallia de Lito. I think so, providing she doesn't do what she did at Kempton. And she got it all wrong very early at Kempton, missed the second fence, landed in the ditch, ultimately pulled up. But if she gets over that experience, I think she's too good for us. She just got freaked by that early mistake, I think, in the Corto star. Sylvan Yaku Conti, are you predicting Tick Dory to reprise his Trump Peterborough win? make all, paint the dream. It'd be interesting if they ride in the same way or they change tactics. OK, well, those are some of the races that we will be analysing this time next week. Thanks again for your company, Thank Ruby. You. If you need more, of course, there's a column, racingtv.com forward slash road to Cheltenham. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. Win our weekly jackpot with Paddy's Pick 5. Pick 5 winners from our 5 races to win and have a free online. Paddy Power! Watch live racing now on RacingTV.com.